Hello and welcome to Unleashed. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm so excited to be here today with John Driscoll. So John has played a leading role in creating many of the successful companies that you are familiar with. Medco, SureScripts, Oxford Health Plans, CareCentrics. He's currently the president of Walgreens Boots Alliance, and he's also a fellow podcaster. He's the host, a uh, co-host, I should say, uh, along with David Williams of the second largest healthcare podcast on YouTube, Care Talk, and they cover a wide range of topics. You can learn about monkeypox and mask mandates and the baby formula shortage and how the failure of Silicon Valley Bank affects healthcare, insulin, all sorts of topics, anything healthcare related on his podcast. John, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much. I mean, and and yeah, we've got opinions on everything, and hopefully some of them are informed at Care Talk. And just one slight change: I am actually the president of uh, Walgreens Health. The, there, there's plenty of other parts of of Walgreens, but I am uh, I'm just delighted to be on the show. Fantastic! Oh, thank you for that correction. So, John. I was wondering if you could start by giving us a bit about your journey uh, in your career. You've gone through multiple different places within the health you know, industry spectrum, and I wonder if you could give us a, a bit of a tour. Well, I, I, I think it's, it starts with my mom's a nurse. And I think early on, I, I had this notion that healthcare was, was sort of special because my mom was a, or is a nurse, even at 90 years old. And um, I, rather than, I ended up as a management consultant like you did at, at LEK earlier in my career. But uh, before I did that, after college, I actually developed housing programs for homeless uh, families and mentally ill people. And I realized just the disconnect between resources and, uh, and results. And as a young consultant, I was working on a, a health plan reorganization among a bunch of other projects. And I realized that, that what I loved about uh, being mission-driven organizations and having an impact on the world could be combined with sort of some business expertise to make a change in people's lives through healthcare. And so I, after that, I migrated to um, uh, Oxford Health Plan, where I was an entry-level employee and met the first leader in Medicare and Medicaid. And you, like most situations, you'd rather be lucky than smart. We we grew very very quickly from about 100 million to four and a half billion in five years, and then went through a, a bit of a crash and a turnaround. And then I got to then that sort of launched me well honestly into healthcare technology and PBM and everything else. I I, I found the the career to be just absolutely full of big gnarly problems where if you get them right you can you can help improve the world and build great organizations and and and, and create some, some some business success as well so it's just been a ball let's talk about your current role at uh, leading health at walgreens boots alliance talk to us about some of the you know key initiatives that you have going on that are public and some of the major trends that we should be looking at in the kind of pharmacy world in in the u.s well i think i think the, the the most exciting things we have going on right now are our investments in village md and summit which is a uh, one of the largest employed uh doctor uh practice management businesses that's working very closely with us to optimize and show the impact of how a combined integrated pharmacy and clinical model in value-based and in fee-for-service can be powerful uh, and effective at improving outcomes. Uh, Bestman and Shield Specialty Pharmacy, which is doing the same thing just in the specialty pharmacy world for health systems, better outcomes at lower cost, and CareCentrix. Uh, we own all three. CareCentrix is involved with working with health plans to improve the last mile of healthcare, again, delivering quite you know, measurable better outcomes at lower costs. And what's, you know, we're working with doctors, we're working with health systems, we're working with health plans. And then you combine that with Walgreens 9,000 stores and 90,000 clinicians uh, that are tuning themselves, not just to become a, be a better retailer at, at, and, a, and better at pharmacy services, but a better partner to health plans, providers, um, uh, I, I think we've got a really interesting set of assets 
all of which are focused on creating um, either leveraging the, the, the low cost access and convenience, trust and traffic we have in the stores or are working towards building more of an integrated pharmacy and clinical care experience that will deliver a better outcome. You know, we're really investing in and leveraging some of the fastest growing markets in healthcare to play in places where we've got a, a right to participate because we're good, we're great at pharmacy services and we're good at retail. Uh, and our goal is to be as essential in healthcare as we are currently in retail and pharmacy services. And uh, part of that is investing in the, 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 the where, sort of where the puck is going in healthcare. And part of it is really showing that as an integrated team uh, through all of our expertise in retail, all of our expertise in pharmacy, and what we have in our building in healthcare, that we can really be a great partner to, to help uh, doctors, hospitals, and health plans uh, do a better job. You know, what we're good at is not what legacy healthcare is good at. Um, brand, marketing, trust, convenience, um, really getting very customer and patient specific. Um, and we think we provide lots of uh, attractive alternatives to partner to help extend the work uh, while lowering costs and improving outcomes for health plans and providers. Yeah. Share some specific examples of how that what that means in practice of being a better partner sure. to health plans. So, you know, some people might think, oh, the pharmacy, you go there, they just give you the pills and you go home. Like, so what are, what's the ways that the pharmacy can so, really so add think, value? Th yeah. So think, think about like, well, what are our advantages? You know, we've got brand convenience, trust and traffic. Um, what does that turn into? Well, for one of the large regional health plans, our uh, return rate for colorectal screenings is three times what their colorectal screenings were beforehand, you know, north of 20% return rate, 3x what they could do on their own. We have uh, we tested uh, um, the, the, the same screenings when we, off, when we can offer the support of a, uh, of a, of a, of a non-clinical person or a clinical person in the store that goes up to over 51% in colorectal cancer is a very serious risk and a major, uh, an unnecessarily high source of mortality, particularly in underserved areas. 40% of our stores, of our 9,000 stores, are in medically underserved areas. So we can play a direct role in screening, care, and navigation for that particular condition. Um, in the case of CareCentrics, we're partnering with health plans and lowering um, their number of unnecessary readmissions and admissions to nursing homes by 20%. We can, we can provide that care navigation and support to caregivers and their families to prevent those um, by either sending nurses to the home, uh, following up with folks centrally by giving them, helping them do care navigation, dealing with all the things outside of traditional healthcare that affect or, 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 or obstruct patients from getting the care they need and we can make sure that as they see pharmacists and phar you're going to see your pharmacist typically particularly for chronically ill patients a lot more than you're going to see your doctor uh, to provide those care nudges and care support and care information that will help patients stay aligned with the care that they're on or change it because they're something showing something's driving uh, whether it's a social determinant barrier or um, an, uh, an unexpected side effect that keeps people from either getting care or staying on the care um, path that they need to be on. So, you know, what, what, what uh, proximity gives you and uh, repeated contact give you is more of an ability to connect and influence and frankly get better data um, for patients. I mean, one, one simple example uh, is that we have better contact information because we're seeing the patients more frequently. So we know where they live, we know how to what their what their telephone numbers are. And that seems rather small, but it's pretty significant when you're trying to do follow-up care and, and just try to help families navigate the uh, the, 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 the 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 difficult for us that often getting the right care is for patients who are ill. No. Many years ago, when I was at McKinsey, I worked on a project for a different pharmacy chain, and it was about 
one of the things that we worked on was increasing the patient customer satisfaction by increasing the amount of time that the pharmacist spent actually counseling patients. You know, at that place, they were spending so much time kind of counting and verifying the pills that they weren't doing as much face-to-face -face time. And when we increased that, uh, there, you know, patient satisfaction went way up. Um, and I think a lot of people weren't even aware that they should ask the pharmacist how to take the you know, medications and so forth. What are some ways that you work at Walgreens to you know, make sure that or to, you know, to measure, encourage, incent, uh, allow the pharmacist to be giving that kind of patient care uh, that, that they're trained to give? Well, we're, we're investing in, um, we Walgreens are investing in um, um, automated fulfillment centers that are centralized and regional. Uh, and the goal is to take a lot of the busy work that is a necessary part of what a pharmacist does to make sure that the right pills get to the right patient at the right time and the right dosage. Uh, as m the more we can leverage robotic automation, the more we're gonna free up that time. M most pharmacists go to pharmacy school, farm techs get involved with it because they do really care about the patients and they wanna spend more time with them. But we've, we've overwhelmed them with complexity and tasks that have kept them away from reduced the exposure to the patients. And you're absolutely right. The more time where a clinician is going human to human, the happier they are. So it's not just the MPS for the patient and the family, but it also is for the pharmacist. And so we've invested a pretty a significant amount of money to build bespoke automation machines that will drive and permit um, uh, pharmacists to really spend probably 20 or 30 percent more of their time eyeball to eyeball with patients and their and their caregivers to help them navigate care. And I think it's going to be a positive, not just for our Metro Motor Scores, but also for the farm, for our, our own employees. How do you alert the pharmacist or maybe prioritize like which patients they should really speak with? Is there is there kind of some kind of system in place that would help them say we this? Do, is... we, 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 we do have systems in place, but honestly, a lot of this is common sense. Think about it. You know, you, when you've got someone on multiple men, they have that information. When someone shows up at the pharmacy desk, when depending on the type of medication, you can kind of tell whether, and, and by the look of that patient or the, the look of fear or concern or uncertainty in the person picking up the pills. Um, you know, this is a lot of this is common sense and, and the data in front of them, but we do have the ability to message and cue um, physician workflow. But honestly, we just have to, I believe, we just have to create more room in, in pharmacist schedules for them to do the work they want to do and leverage their common sense. Because pharmacists are, again, these are people who are, who are highly observant, well-trained, who are, who are dealing with patients every day. Uh, but we do have the ability to message them, but a lot of this is common sense. What regulatory barriers exist, if any, that currently prevent pharmacists or the people in the pharmacy, pharmacy techs for that matter, from providing certain types of services that they really have the training to do, but perhaps aren't allowed in certain jurisdictions? Oh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crazy quill patchwork of regulations. You know, it's one of these things where the, the industry grew up with the clinical rules being passed to, uh, through state pharmacy boards that individually have to approve uh, work rules, and particularly around scope of practice. The work rules of, are standardized around you know, right pill, right person, right dosage, but um, and the oversight there. But whether you can, for whether pharmacy techs, which they are in the UK and in England nationally, can check blood pressure, which is really easy, um, is uh, it can only be done in certain states in the US. Um, and there are a number of other examples where the, the, the phar pharmacists can, if they had the, the, if they were approved by the state pharmacy boards, they could provide a lot more care support and care navigation. Um, you see it in, 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 in limits of scope of practice around testing. And we did um, probably 40 or 50 million tests in the, in stores, but we tended to have to, uh, lease that space out to a lab core or an Aegis or others. Uh, you know, the pharmacies during the public health emergency were the public, were the 
with a front door to the public health system that doesn't exist. You know, two thirds of all vaccines and arms came through pharmacies. Uh, and that's because the healthcare system was not set up for that kind of entry level care, follow up and support. Um, and so we proved during the public health emergency that pharmacists can do the screening, counsel the patients, provide the care, uh, but it's but it really is a patchwork of individual restrictions or opportunities. And we're working at the state level and at the federal level to educate healthcare leaders and regulators on the value of expanding the scope of practice, which is just the, the rules that permit you to do more or less as a pharmacist, because the healthcare system is bursting at the seams with tasks that need to be done, patients that need care, and not enough clinicians available, nurses and doctors conventionally, to provide it. So I think that's a big opportunity to expand access and provide more care and follow-up if we can get that, we can expand the scope of practice for pharmacists. I've seen some articles recently saying that we are not really, we haven't taken all the lessons of COVID to heart in terms of preparing for the next public health emergency or the next pandemic. Tell me your perspective of what are some things that in terms of, you know, from the, in the pharmacy world that, you know, should still be done, or maybe you'd say, no, no, we are, we're much better prepared because of, because of X, but are there, are there sort of un steps that still should be taken uh, to be better prepared for the next pandemic? Well, let's build them. I mean, for sure. Um, and let me break it into pieces. At the, there are a, a number of legacy restrictions on things like telehealth or pharmacy scope of practice and others that were just dropped during the public health emergency. And it turned out that the healthcare system can adapt pretty well, even in its regulated way, to new technologies, novel approaches for care and follow up. And one of the things that, we, that, we, that will hurt us, us from um, lowering the cost of getting and, and allowing that kind of follow-up and, and make it harder in a public health emergency is if all those restrictions return. So I think that's the, that's the first thing is the flexibility and the terms that we got, we, we shouldn't go back. The second thing is it taught us a lesson that if we can adapt, that we should be, the healthcare system in general can responsibly take risks on novel approaches to care and follow-up which is the lesson that we really need. We're trying to drive through the CARES Act and, care, and through the, 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 regula the, the regulations and laws we're trying to expand to allow pharmacists to expand their scope of practice. Um, but the third thing, I guess, is more of a government thing versus a Walgreens Health or pharmacist thing, which is that, you know, look, the, as a country, we are extraordinary once the crisis starts but not always focused on preparing uh, before the balloon goes up or the fire starts or however, whatever metaphor you want to use. And I think with the, what we, with, we would have saved hundreds of thousands of more people if we were as good at the beginning of the public health emergency in terms of stockpiles of medicine, um, 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 availability of training, um, vaccine availability and public communication and those muscles which got really strong as a country later in the pandemic I think are ones that we've got to be really care careful don't atrophy whether that's purchasing and pre-planning pre, pre uh, or pre-deploying uh, materials around the country um, or really integrating our national and local public health authorities to come up with solutions that um, are appropriate not just for downtown Manhattan, but but are available in kind of rural Iowa. Um, you know, we did a really great job, um, but it, it it required the entire system to move faster, um, um, expand in novel ways, leverage low cost access to talent and labor that was already clinically engaged pharmacists and local pharmacies. Um, but we were playing a lot of catch up, and I don't want to be there again because because it's sort of like a hurricane. They won't, they, you don't know, you don't necessarily, they're not necessarily, a hurricane's not necessarily going to hit you tomorrow, but if you're in a hurricane area, eventually it'll hit and you want to be prepared for it. And that's the way we've got to think about our public health uh, risks. Uh, but one of the things, again, two cheers for all of our pharmacists who really delivered. 
and the pharmacies that stayed open throughout the entire pandemic as an essential access point for supply support for uh, vulnerable uh, our vulnerable citizens. So I think we proved that, that we, you know, pr prior to the pandemic, I think if you think about retail pharmacy, people think of it as more retail and less pharmacy. I think if we proved during the pandemic that we can be a great partner to the healthcare system, low cost access everywhere, um, nearly always available. And obviously you know, there's a lot of, a, lo a lot of our pharmacists and pharmacies are a little bit whipped from that public health emergency, but we proved we can deliver for healthcare. And so what I'm excited about go looking forward is how do we play, continue to play a bigger role in the healthcare industry? I've heard there's a shortage of pharmacists. I'm not sure about pharmacist techs. Talk me about that and about, you know, how you leading Walgreens health are, are addressing it. I think there's the the, the there's a, the challenge of, of clinician burnout is a problem across the entire spectrum. So the way we at Walgreens are, are dealing with it is we are we are improving um, working conditions, work roles. We're trying to reduce the number of unnecessary work roles. We're increasing pay. Um, we are engaging more directly with pharmacy schools to help uh, provide uh, easier access to. Um, to work in pharmacies, which pharmacy, young, young pharmacy students really like. We're expanding what they can do clinically. And we are, through our investments in central fill um, and robotics, trying to, uh, at an even different layer, reduce the number, not just of the rules, but of the tasks that are closer to routine and busy work to allow pharmacists to practice closer to the top of their license. Um, but it's, it's one of those challenges, given the demographics of the country with 10,000 people turning Medicare eligible every day, um, that you, you fight to stay ahead of uh, because we are coming out of a public health emergency and we're, we're hitting kind of the grain of, uh, of the country. But it, uh, it's a, uh, you've got to have a kind of a multi-threat defense to get on offense to turn this, uh, to, to, to solve our labor problems in healthcare in general. You mentioned value-based care earlier. Could you talk a little bit more about that and about how value-based care is now, you know, showing up in kind of the pharmacy health world? Well, I think you know, really, value-based care is simply um, healthcare on a budget, and uh, healthcare should be on a budget. Uh, you just realize what the budget is after you realize the bills have gone up. We have the, the, the most expensive healthcare in the system in the country system in the industrialized world on a on an expense per mem per, per 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 person and we're not where we are not top 20 in probably any of the mortality statistics uh and performance statistics other than cancer care where we do an exceptionally good job at screening and care um that's unacceptable and one approach to that is to really give doctors and health plans uh health plans often giving uh health systems and groups of doctors, um, performance-based compensation where either they capitate, they, all of the care is, 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 is paid for with one payment or it's performance-based. Either one of them could be considered value-based. And I think it's a really good thing. We should be measuring our healthcare system. Um, we should force it on a, on a, on a, to have a reasonable budget. And then when you've got that budget, then what happens is the clinicians themselves can, through a different mix, have nurses do play at the top of their license, doctors play at the top of their license, maybe have a social worker or a dietitian talk about folks' diet. Um, you can provide, you, it's, a, it's a much more, doctors and, and, and groups like Village take a much more comprehensive view of the members that they cover in a value-based arrangement because they're paid to. The, the better job they do at avoiding unnecessary care or care breakdowns, the more they can address the whole person needs, social, emotional, physical, food, that can often directly lead to um, an, un, an unnecessary hospitalization, uh, uh, too many unwarranted visits to the emergency room. Um, you're paying the doctors to perform and to engage members more upstream before they get into the hospital or the emergency room. And so I think value-based care is, 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 uh, is, is the future. And we've made a big investment in that with 
Village MD, which is a group of employed doctors that are high performing, that are highly focused on their 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 Medicare patients. Uh, Summit is doing one of the, another one of our assets company we invested in in uh, New York that does a great job on performance based payments with commercial um, uh, patients. Their admissions per thousand, the number of admissions they have for the 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 the, the the, more, the commercially covered members, the younger patients they see, is 20% below their, their peers. Um, and at CareCentrics, we're doing the same thing. We're managing your budget to lower unnecessary visits to the hospital or the or nursing home. So I think that performance-based payment and and healthcare sort of payment on a we're looking at it from more of a conventional budgetary view is the future, and it's the only way. We're going to get under or around the inflation that you know that healthcare costs are really an excess tax um, on every American. Let's talk about your podcast for a minute, Care Talk. It's among the top ten podcasts in healthcare on Apple and Spotify. It's not that usual to have a senior executive at a major Fortune 500 company running a podcast i'd love to hear the story <laughs> behind it it's like if you know it's like, you know, I, I, it's like I, if I joe think, biden has like a politics podcast or something well the great thing about a podcast you know health look healthcare is really complicated and it's unnecessarily complicated but it's connected to everything in our lives and my friend david williams who's my um my partner in this and i believe there's a space in the landscape for us to take topics that we felt strongly about or had some opinions about and kick it around um, to help um, our colleagues, our friends, the people we work with, the people who work for us, uh, in some cases the people we work for, to understand and get aligned with or provoke the right conversations. Um, and I think what 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 we like, what, what, what well, too much of what is in the podcast landscape is oriented towards um, who's paying the bills on the adverts or a particular perspective. And we thought there was a lane in healthcare for you know, an honest, unfiltered look at some of the harder questions um, from two you know, somewhat opinionated, or perhaps overly opinionated um, executives who uh, had some opinions. And uh, we we're kind of happily surprised that it's taken off. We're averaging, I think, over 40,000 streams per episode. We, do, we, we, we record weekly. We've had episodes that got up to over 100, and 100 plus thousand streams, and that speaks to me of, of a, a real uh, need in the marketplace. Just how do you get your medical record and why should you care? I think it was over 80,000 streams. Um, so it's not just the, the grand ep episodes around drug pricing, which get you know, a fair amount of streams, but, but even more conventional or uh, mundane issues. I mean, healthcare is complicated, and we try to make it uh, simpler, clear, hopefully sometimes a little bit funny, and um, and then, then express an opinion, which gives people sort of an act. Oh, hopefully, our goal is to give our audience to inform, entertain, and get in and out of a complicated topic to bring folks up to date, you know, within 20 minutes. And it's it's been a ball to do, and I think we 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 got a little bit of a following, so it's been it's been fun. It's, it was sort of in the accidental success that we continue to invest in. Well, not accidental. That's uh, congratulations. That's amazing. Now you've had some really incredible guests. You know, Andy Slavitt, Zeke Emanuel, uh, Tony Cosgrove, uh, Amy Abernathy, and many others. Tell me about a couple things that you've learned on the show that have surprised you, or that you found enlightening that you've learned from your guests you know i think i think what 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 the the most striking thing about you know whether it's zeke or toby cosgrove or is that there's still room you know that, again we're we're healthcare so complicated and people are in silos that there's still room for novel provocative uh, opinions um that are simply explained you know I, I again what we find is with our um um uh, like everybody knows that um uh drug costs are too high uh but to break down the practical ways of how you would get at 
bringing drug costs down without screwing up uh, and undermining this amazing um, 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 industry of biotechnology that's creating novel novel drugs that will literally cure diseases uh, and extend uh, age and extend our lifespan. Um, um, how, how do you unpack those issues? That there is that there there are really good people working on these issues, and there are really interesting solutions. Um, it's for Toby Cosgrove, the challenges of uh, how do you run a complicated, big, um, um, successful hospital? It's one of the best hospitals in the world for healthcare for hearts, but also a deeply important local institution for Cleveland with the Cleveland Clinic. And how do you do it while enhancing and really creating a leading role in in in, um, in creating heart-centered care in a massive? Uh, inner city hospital with hundreds of with probably 100,000 employees. Um, you know, I just, I, I suppose it's less, the, the, I, I learned from every, we learned from every guest and it, it reminds us that we got to stay humble because of all the stuff we don't know. But there are a lot of people out there working on really great solutions to our, um, our heart, our gnarly healthcare problems. Just, just to hear how excited and how much opportunity there is in telehealth. I think we're gonna we're gonna start to dig into chat GPT and AI to solve the labor shortage problem you raised earlier to bring folks in who can who can create who can kind of map out a path where through a combination of technology and improved work rules we can actually get the capacity and support we need for clinicians to take care of all these people who are getting older and who are chronically ill while also um, extending lifespan. It's just, it's, it's, it's thrilling. I guess it's less, uh, I, I, we learn something new every week. I, it's hard to pull one or two things out. It keeps us humble. You mentioned AI and chat GPT. It's early days, but what have you seen so far in terms of, you know, any, any uh, health company in the whole, you know, spectrum using those sorts of tools or even experimenting with using those sorts of tools? Well, I think that the, the, the not chat GPT specifically, because it's really, it appears to, to me at least to be really focused on is sort of being the extended personal assistant and researcher and it, and, and all, allowing it to you know, write essays and emails and quickly do research. And it's very early days, but what's what what's what we need to watch there is it's learning at a faster pace than any form of data driven machine learning has ever. And so what you see today is going to rapidly increase into into what will truly be fully automated digital assistants that are going to learn faster than 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 the humans um, that will, I think, allow people to, again, do more higher level work. Where I see the impact in artificial intelligence is um, that the, the there we spend I don't know probably fifteen to twenty percent of all costs on um, administrative costs in the U.S. It's just it's just stunning. I don't, that number may be high, but that it's out of a four trillion dollar economy. I think there's easily two or three hundred basis points in hundreds of billions of dollars that just sim- simply learning what goes right and wrong administratively before you even get into drug discovery or better clinical pathways or understanding social determinants of health. Um, a perfect example is one of the companies I'm involved with, Waystar. It's a revenue cycle software business that sells that software to hospitals to simplify and make their billing more efficient. As they are investing in AI and intelligent algorithms, they're going to simplify and automate a lot of the tasks that are quite mundane that hospitals do just around reconciliation to get paid and get a bill out. Um, those are those are those are very machine learnable and will reduce costs dramatically over time. And then you move to the the amount of complexity, but how much data we have for all the drugs we've tried and all the drugs we've abandoned as we learn more about profiling individuals to really personalize um, you know, uh, uh, pharmacy-related, drug-related care. I think we're going to again that the the these artificial intelligence mo- uh, models, large language models, just need massive amounts of data. And in healthcare, we got a lot of that. And I think drug discovery, and then finally care pathways. Um, and we we work off of averages. And yet everyone's an individual. I think the um, 
the uh, the opportunity in healthcare is pretty dramatic. The first place you're going to see that I think is reduction of of, of uh, unnecessary costs and waste just spent in sort of cutting out administrative costs. And then over time, I think you're going to see it in drug dis discovery and, and novel care, care novel approaches to care. It's really exciting, and and I think it's hard to overestimate how fast these these models and these technologies are going to learn how to do things better where they've got the data to train the models. Amazing. Who, who is a guest that you're looking forward to getting on care talk that you have not yet? Um, I would love today. I would love to get Larry Summers, the former secretary of the treasury, um, uh, to tell, to, to, to test our assumptions on in a rocky economy. How does, how to help, how does healthcare fare? Costs are still going up. Out of the pandemic, there's a inflation kicked up because a lot of physicians and nurses are burnt out, and there's some structural changes in the labor industry. Um, traveling nurses, be nurses who are paid by private equity firms to charge at the you know, for, for moving around to different hospitals, they're charging two three times as much as a conventional nurse. Um, uh, we've got hospitals having the worst last six months of the of financially that they've ever had in the U.S. So how does the, the convergence or the divergence of sort of um, low, 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 low cost uh, interest and, and, a, and a, a smooth, a relatively smooth economy translate into um, our, our currently chaotic times and what's the knock on impact on healthcare? I think he'd be an interesting guest to have on because I just think that it, you, know, you can't divorce what goes on in healthcare from the economy, particularly when it's going sideways. I am sure that you are just swimming in an ocean of information about the world of healthcare. I'm curious, what are the sources of information that you use to keep up to date? Are there other podcasts you listen to or newsletters or Substack or websites, or is it primarily conferences or journals? Like, What's your information diet? Well, I think, you know, you know, uh, um, Health Tech Nerds uh, is a really good good uh, good group to join. Um, I, I watch, you know, read the journals, Health Affairs, and others. Check out JAMA and Science for sure. And then I uh, I'm, I'm constantly scanning. Um, uh, you know, the, the the MIT's got a tech review that's really good on future stuff. But just the Washington Post, New York Times, LA Times, Wall Street Journal are all really good sources for current news. Um, for farther out, I think you've got to you've got to look at some of the journals like Science and Cell. But it's uh, I've got to say that the, the 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 health tech nerds is one that probably comes into my the one that I that jumps out in. And I will surf different podcasts for more by topic than by person. Mm -hmm. um, right now, I'm, I'm I'm hunting for good insights on AI and and uh, and healthcare because I just don't think it's well covered. Um, and and um, but those are some of the sources that I uh, that I that I go to, and um, and I and honestly pay a lot of attention to the people we've had on the show. I mean, Zeke Emanuel, he's not always right, but he's always interesting, hmm. and he's always super thoughtful. Um, and um, and then obviously conferences and, and stuff. But conferences aren't as aren't, aren't as helpful in terms of data. And then honestly, the the, the other thing that, that that's really worth um, you know hunting down and paying attention to is. You know, the, the Kaiser Family Foundation, Kaiser Health News is exceptional. Um, and a lot of the basic government sources, um, you know, CMS has a, a ton of information um, on basic data. You know, the reality is you can, on any topic, if you're going after uh, core data on, on healthcare in, industry, you often go to CMS first and then work out from there. But uh, again, the, the challenge of a four trillion dollar economy that encompasses everything in healthcare is you got to bounce around a lot. But I guess the the core healthcare diet on uh, in terms of information would be health health tech nerds, health affairs, uh, Kaiser Health News, and then the conventional uh, new, new uh, magazines and uh, and newspapers. Fantastic, John Driscoll. We will include a link to. Care Talk in the show notes. Uh, awesome. Any other links that you would like us to include for listeners to uh, to follow up and find out what you're working? I, I on? think I've laid laid, laid, laid out a, a bunch there, but but keep watch, keep an eye out for what we're going to do at Walgreens Health. I'm really excited about 
where we started. And uh, I think we, BS and Walgreen, Walmart are all going to have a, a big impact on the future state of bringing down healthcare costs and improving outcomes. So I'm delighted to be at, at uh, Walgreens Health. Fantastic. Thanks so much for coming on the show and sharing that perspective. It's been great speaking with you. And congrats on Care Talk. Cheers. Thanks so much. Thanks for having us.